In honor of Martin Luther King Day, we have an opportunity to join together this morning to learn from a distinguished educator and trailblazer in the Jewish community. Having served as a civil rights worker in the 1960s, Peter has dedicated much of his life's work in education to passionately advancing ideals of social justice, inclusivity, and the enduring legacy of Dr. King. In addition to earning the prestigious Covenant Award in 2012, Peter founded the Abraham Joshua Heschel School in Manhattan, where I first had the chance to hear from him over 20 years ago, served as executive director of the Center for Jewish History, and recently, or not so recently, established the Kivunim Institute Gap Year Program and Teacher Fellowship. In each of these roles, Peter has had a significant influence on day schools across America, enriching Jewish identities and inspiring countless students to join him in breaking down barriers between different cultures and faiths and building a more compassionate and equitable world. It is my distinct privilege to welcome Peter Geffen. The stand is coming. The stand is here. That's what's even better. It's a little in my face. Yeah, it's great. I, I have a loud voice. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, OK. So first of all, um, this is a uh, big treat. And I'm, uh, I was uh, honored by the request. And, uh, and I'm honored to be with you. Second of all, or really first of all, you know, th it, it's uh, hard to uh, switch emotions and uh, topics. You know, this morning, uh, as I'm sure all of you have heard by now, there was a, a car ramming and woman killed and people injured and um, in a place where everybody feels, you know, it would be like uh, in a street in Riverdale, Renana. So uh, that sadness. Um, in many ways, you could say that what I'm going to talk about is the same topic. And I hope that in a certain way, you'll understand what I mean when I'm done. But certainly, my heart and all of our hearts are uh, in multiple places at the moment, uh, including at the gates of the, those two hospitals in Israel where the, the victims of this uh, both unnecessary and, and wanton violence uh, are being taken care of and hopefully cured. So if we can switch gears, um, I'm going to talk uh, about a, a lot of things having to do with Martin Luther King, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, my own experience. Because uh, this is a formal presentation, I normally speak as I'm speaking now informally and without notes. Um, and by the way, when Beth said she heard me speak 20 years ago, I was an infant, you know, when, when she, I mean, I, it may not be apparent, but, uh, you know, this is all just makeup. Um, so, um, so I, 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 it's funny when somebody says they heard you speak 20 years ago, you know, it's like pretty wild. Anyway, so I'm going to speak formally or semi-formally for the first part of this program. And then when we have questions, obviously, uh, will, will be a, a different tone and mood. And I encourage you, as I'm speaking, to formulate whatever questions or comments you have. A and certainly, in no way are you required to agree with my conclusions. Um, I just hope that this will open up an arena. Many of the people in this room were not even a dream in their parents' eye when these events that I'm talking about were taking place. So, um, so I don't know exactly how you feel, although I must say the following. 
uh, every, every year at the Heschel School since we began 40 years ago, the King Day Assembly is a major piece of now different divisions. And on Friday morning, uh, after a, a wonderful little uh, kindergarten, pre-K, nursery, so-called King Day Assembly that I'm the guest speaker at, and my grandson Gabriel, a Riverdale resident, by the way, um, uh, is sitting in the room with, with, uh, with my daughter, with his mom, sitting on her lap. We go to our, our elementary school, uh, really very annually very powerful event. And the most par powerful moment is that in a room with hundreds and hundreds of kids, when Dr. King's speech goes on a big screen, it's a big screen in a big auditorium, nobody says, shh, everybody is silent. And every year I'm sort of amazed, how's that possible? First graders are in the first row. I am sure there are first grade teachers here. The idea of first graders sitting, turning their sound off immediately, watching a screen, captivated for many minutes without a peep and a look on their face. This year, I decided to take out my phone and, and video it because I sort of talk about it to people and they don't believe me. And that power is Dr. King's power. And it's part of what I'm speaking about. And, um, and I hope that you'll find that what I have to say is both interesting but also challenging. Because we're really at a moment, particularly as a result of these last 101 days, we're at a moment where, understandably, the Jewish community is inclined to retreat into itself. We're disappointed in the care and concern of others with us, and we're worried. And what I hope you'll at least be challenged by in what I'm saying is that that is not an acceptable stance for the American Jewish community, no matter what. And I hope that the models of Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel will, as I said, at least, if not give you a way of thinking, at least challenge some of the way in which you may be thinking. And of course, if we're on the same page, then we're on the same page. The March on Washington, in August of 1963, was scheduled to enable it to mark 100 years since the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. We're all familiar with the part of Dr. King's speech where he spoke of the dream that he had. But in reality, Things in that speech which most of us are unfamiliar with are equally important to hear and understand. I'm going to quote some of the body of the speech one or two minutes into it. The words of Dr. King. One hundred years later, the Negro still is not free. One hundred years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American 
was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is corrupt, is bankrupt. Good slip of the tongue. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. Just some slides to sort of remind you of what that really meant. In the Jewish tradition, as you know better than I, memory is a mandate. Every Shabbat, Every holiday begins with a prayer, the Kiddush, that includes the word Zecher Lema'aseh Bereshit, which means as a memory, as a memorialization of creation. Now those few just spoken words may make you a little nervous because you invited me here to speak about civil rights and Dr. King, and I'm beginning to sound like a rabbi giving a Devar Torah. And I'm not a rabbi, I'm a son of, father of, grandson of, etc., nephew of, not me. But I am giving a Devar Torah because, that's it? Okay. I thought the timing was really, you know. Like, because if we are to properly and powerfully undertake a memorialization of that great day, 60 years ago, the March on Washington, we need to examine and understand its philosophical foundations and, of course, of the whole civil rights movement. And those foundations are found in the biblical story of creation. No, not because I'm claiming that the Bible story is scientifically correct, you may feel it is or it isn't, but because it is spiritually essential. One man and one woman are the father and mother of all people. And current DNA research reveals that our DNA is almost exactly the same from one person to the next, no matter our gender, our skin color, our hair, our age. The biblical metaphor may be more powerful than we ever realized. My teacher, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, about whom we will hear more shortly, once said, and I quote, People who see or judge other people on the basis of the color of their skin have an eye disease. And we don't know to this day whether he meant an eye disease or an eye disease. What happened in 1963 that made that march possible and brought forth the words, I have a dream that no one will ever forget, words that are recognized around the world decades after the day they were spoken. I would like to take us back to that era to help us appreciate both what took place, what the aftermath of that day has been, and where we must go from here to fulfill the destiny granted us that day in Dr. King's 
beautiful imagination. Let me also explain why I, a white Jewish man, am speaking today about this memory of yesterday. My life was blessed with the opportunity to work for Dr. King in the summers of 1965 and 1966. I was privileged to be in his presence on many occasions during those immensely powerful years. I heard him speak and preach many times in small black churches to congregations of illiterate sons and daughters of slaves, or in the pews of the great Riverside Church in New York City. He was one of the great teachers of my life. In 1965, In 1965, at the end of our summer work in Orangeburg, South Carolina, where we had been sent to teach unschooled people how to write their names so they could attempt to register to vote, an attempt which you will remember was almost always denied, you've seen it in the movies, we gathered in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Ebenezer Baptist Church, several hundred volunteers to assess the summer's work and plan for the coming year. At the break, midday, we walked out the back door when this picture, my most treasured physical possession, was taken. There was a man standing in front of us with a Polaroid camera. And my friend, person in the middle of this picture, Mickey Schur of Detroit, now Orthodox Rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Schur, asked if this man with the Polaroid camera would take our picture with Dr. King. When the picture developed two minutes later, Dr. King asked to autograph it. And on the back of the original that hangs in my home, are the words, quote, best wishes and thanks for your help, Martin Luther King. I will tell you more about my association with Dr. King later in this presentation. Why did Mickey and I and hundreds of other volunteers go to the South in 1964, 65, and 66? For me, my motivation came directly from the Holocaust. I was 14 years old in 1960 when the first documentary films began to appear about the destruction of European Jewry. At that point, we knew very little beyond the number six million. The immensely powerful book Night by Elie Wiesel was first published in English that same year, 1960. But what we had been taught in Hebrew school and summer camp, there weren't very many day schools more powerfully than anything else, was the simple indictment of the average German citizen, the one who never shot a gun or directly did violence to anyone. That simple German citizen who we were told could have stood up, even at the risk of their life, and said no. I want to play for you the words that you probably have never heard from the March on Washington, from Rabbi Joachim Prinz, who spoke at the march, he'll describe it in a second, he spoke at the march two places or one place before Dr. King. Nothing could therefore write somebody out of history, but you'll hear his remarks are quite significant. We spent some time this week marking the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, and one of the most important speeches in the history of this country. But more than one man articulated a dream that day, even if the power of Martin Luther King overshadowed them. It was the toughest time slot of the day, never mind having to follow Mahalia Jackson, the queen of gospel. I wish I could sing. Rabbi Joachim Prince was the last man up before Martin Luther King. I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime. 
The horrors this rabbi witnessed in Nazi Germany in the 30s compelled him to challenge America in the 60s. Bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problems. The most shameful and the most tragic problem is silence. It was really marvelous to see a quarter of a million people become... Rabbi Israel Dresner, a protege of Prince's, was standing just a few feet away on the podium that day and could feel the power of Prince's message ripple through the crowd. That really rang a bell because all sorts of clergy in America, you know, they weren't racist, they weren't bigots personally, but they just kept their mouths shut. As the wise man once said, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Exactly, exactly. Prinz was expelled from Germany in the late 30s and came to Newark, New Jersey. My friend, Rabbi Prinz. Where his congregation welcomed the young Dr. King twice. So there was a direct line between the Holocaust and the American civil rights struggle? Absolutely. Jews are opposed to injustice. We are opposed to uh, hatred and bigotry and bias and racism and exploitation and so forth. And that's what we're supposed to be opposed to. America must not become a nation of onlookers. As he had three decades before, Prince refused to be silent and encouraged all Americans to speak up just as loudly. America must not remain silent. Not merely black America. Rabbi Joachim Prince. He said further, a great people which had created a great civilization had become a nation of silent onlookers. They remained silent in the face of hate, in the face of brutality, and in the face of mass murder. America, as you heard him say, must not become a nation of onlookers. Prince continued, America must not remain silent, not merely black America, but all of America. It must speak up and act from the president down to the humblest of us, and not for the sake of the Negro, not for the sake of the black community, but for the sake of the image, the idea, and the aspiration of America itself. And personally, Obviously, I would add, for the sake of the image, the idea and the aspiration of creation itself, Zecher Lema'aseh Bereshit. Isabella Wilkinson begins her immensely important book, Cast, with the following story of this photograph that you have on the screen. There is, she says, a famous black and white photograph from the era of the Third Reich. It is a picture taken in Hamburg, Germany in 1936 of shipyard workers, a hundred or more, facing the same direction in the light of the sun. They are hiling in unison, their right arms rigid in outstretched allegiance to the Fuhrer. If you look closely, you can see a man in the upper right who is different from the others. His face is gentle but unyielding. Modern-day displays of the photograph will, as you see here, often add a helpful circle around the man or an arrow pointing to him. He is surrounded by fellow citizens caught under the spell of the Nazis. He keeps his arms folded to his chest as the stiff palms of the others hover just inches from him. He alone is refusing to salute. He is the one man standing against the tide. Looking back from our vantage point, Wilkerson continues, he is the only person in the entire scene who is on the right side of history. Everyone around him is tragically, faithfully, categorically wrong. In that moment, only he could see it. His name is believed to have been August Landmesser. At the time, he could not have known the murderous path the hysteria around him would lead to, but he had already seen enough to reject it. He had joined the Nazi party himself years before, but now he knew firsthand that the Nazis were feeding Germans lies about Jews, the outcasts of his era, that even this early in the Reich, the Nazis had caused terror, heartache, and disruption. He knew that Jews were anything but untermenschen, that they were German citizens, 
human as anyone else. He was an Aryan in love with a Jewish woman, but the recently enacted Nuremberg laws had made their relationship illegal. They were forbidden to marry or to have sexual relations, either of which amounted to what the Nazis called racial infamy. His personal experience and close connection to the, shape, to the scapegoated caste allowed him to see past the lies and stereotypes so readily embraced by susceptible members, the majority, sadly, of the dominant caste. Though Aryan himself, his openness to the humanity of the people who had been deemed beneath him gave him a stake in their well-being, their fates tied to his. He could see what his countrymen chose not to see. In a totalitarian regime such as that of the Third Reich, it was an act of bravery to stand firm against an ocean. We would all want to believe that we would have been him. We might feel certain that we, Aryan citizens under the Third Reich, we, we surely would have seen through it, would have risen above it like him, been that person resisting authoritarianism and brutality in the face of mass hysteria. We would like to believe that we would have taken the more difficult path of standing up against injustice in defense of the outcast. But unless people are willing to transcend their fears, endure discomfort and derision, suffer the scorn of loved ones and neighbors and co-workers and friends, fall into disfavor of perhaps everyone they know, face exclusion and even banishment, it would be numerically impossible, humanly impossible, for everyone to be that man. What would it take to be him in any era? What would it take to be him now? As America began to see the realities of the Jim Crow South, that it had known about since Reconstruction, but ignored, even in the segregated capital of Washington, D.C. of the United States. Through lunch counter sit-ins and Freedom Rider buses, and the attempt to desegregate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, as television brought vivid images to our young eyes, we began to understand that this very almost innocent word, segregation, was a form of the most brutal dehumanization imaginable. Black children were growing into a world where their very being was enslaved 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. What Rabbi Prinz understood from his years in Berlin under the boot of Nazism was that silence made us complicit in a stabbing of the heart of every black child who could only understand themselves as being, quote, less than. So for me and almost all of my close friends, when the call went out in 1964 and 65 and 66 to come south, and help the various civil rights organizations working to bring about change. Finally, in our minds and our hearts, we had to do what we had been taught the good Germans did not do. We had to challenge the power structure with our minds and with our bodies. My classmate at Queens College, Andy Goodman, was one of the three boys lynched in Philadelphia, Mississippi in the summer of 1964. When I learned of his death, I decided I had to take his place the following summer. My father, who grew up in Atlanta and knew that the threat posed by the Ku Klux Klan was both real and probable, said, oh, no, you're not. I was 19 years old and responded, oh, yes, I am. Oh, no, you're not, came the rejoinder. And then I said, but this is what you have taught me my whole life. And that was the end of that discussion. I joined the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's SCOPE Project, Summer Community Organization and Political Education Project, in the summer of 1965, and was assigned to work in the city of Orangeburg, South Carolina. We were young and we did not take seriously the dangers that lay before us. For my Jewish friends and I, and the estimates are 
that as many as 50% of the white civil rights workers were Jews, while Jews were under 2% of the American population as a whole. For us, there was simply no choice. We could not stand idly by the blood of our neighbors, period. The lesson of the Holocaust to us was immediate and it was universal. There was, of course, to be real danger. We were followed by police cars everywhere we went. We were subject to arrest if we drove over or under the speed limit on those country roads, often at night when only the police knew the speed limits. That is to say, the speed limits were whatever they wanted them to be. The home where we were hosted was shot at by a policeman, a Ku Klux Klan member, and only by divine providence were none of us hurt as a large picture window was shattered by that bullet and crashed into the living room where we normally sat for evening meetings. Let me stop my personal story for a few moments in order to establish some important background material and then return to my personal experience later. America of the 1960s was still a rather religious country. People went to church and synagogue and the religious community expected of itself to be involved in the social issues of the time. As an aside, I would say today, one of the last places a political movement would think of holding a public rally would be in a church or a synagogue, whereas 60 years ago, there was simply no better place. In the fall of 1962, a group of religious leaders from the then understood religious community of America, it's much bigger today, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, announced the holding of the first National Conference on Religion and Race to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It was to take place at Chicago's Edgewater Beach Hotel from January 14th to 17th, 1963. Over a thousand representatives came together to discuss America's racial problems. Martin Luther King called the gathering, quote, the most significant and historic event ever held for attacking racial injustice, unquote. The purpose of the conference was stated as bringing the moral, the joint moral force of the churches and synagogues of America to bear on the problems of racial segregation. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was asked to represent Judaism at the conference, to which he reluctantly agreed, feeling that he was a European Jew with a thick accent to his English, and that a younger American rabbi would do the job much better. The organizers thought otherwise. He began his remarks with the following words, and I quote, at the first conference on religion and race, the main participants were Moses and Pharaoh. Moses' words were, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me while Pharaoh retorted, Who is the Lord that I should heed this voice and let Israel go? I do not know that Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And then Heschel continued, The outcome of that summit meeting has not come to an end. Pharaoh is not ready to capitulate. The exodus began, but is far from having been completed. In fact, Heschel said, it was easier for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea than for a Negro to cross certain university campuses. Let us dodge no issues. Let us yield no inch to bigotry. Let us make no compromise with callousness." Unquote. Of course, the black American church did not need Rabbi Heschel's permission to strongly identify with the enslavement of the children of Israel. But sitting in the front row, not more than 10 feet from the podium where you are sitting in this front row, sat Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And for the next and the last five years of King's life, 1963 to 1968, the friendship forged between them would reflect the power of that first exchange. In fact, Dr. King was on his way 
to attend the Heschel family Seder in 1968 when he was shot down in Memphis, Tennessee. Heschel continued, Perhaps this conference should have been called Religion or Race. You cannot worship God and at the same time look at man as if he were a horse. Idolatry, Heschel said, is a religious prohibition. What is an idol? Any God who is mine but not yours, any God concerned with me but not with you, is an idol. And finally and most powerfully, Heschel charged, quote, faith in God is not simply an afterlife insurance policy. Racial or religious bigotry must be recognized for what it is, Satanism, blasphemy, unquote. And as an important aside, may I say that we have not stood up to the idolatry of those churches and synagogues who have chosen bigotry, and therefore, in Heschel's words, blasphemy, in the support of certain unmentionable candidates for the presidency of the United States. Heschel understood that the religious community is not vaccinated against the sin of idolatry and must be challenged and confronted. At the close of the conference, attendees adopted an appeal to the conscience of the American people, which concluded with the following words, quote, we call upon all the American people to work, to pray, to act courageously in the cause of human equality and dignity while there is still time to eliminate racism permanently and decisively, to seize the historic opportunity the Lord has given us for healing an ancient rupture in the human family, to do this for the glory of God, unquote. That was January 1963. President Kennedy was worried about the growing religious dissent and cognizant of the difficulties of trying to impose change, even minor change, on the almost exclusively Democratic South. That June, he invited key leadership of the January conference to the White House in what many, in what many believe was an attempt to forestall the then-planned August 28th March on Washington. On June 16th, 1963, Heschel sent the following telegram to President Kennedy in response to an invitation by the President to attend this meeting of religious leaders at the White House. It represents a unique example of the change that was then taking place within the American Jewish community. This is the actual telegram. For those of you who don't know what a telegram is, the most important thing you need to know is that every word and every space cost pennies, but still cost. So you left out anything unnecessary, so it reads funny. Heschel's words, I look forward to privilege of being present at meeting tomorrow. Likelihood exists that Negro problem will be like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Please demand of religious leaders personal involvement, not just solemn declaration. We forfeit the right to worship God as long as we continue to humiliate Negroes. Church, synagogue have failed. They must repent. Ask of religious leaders to call for national repentance and personal sacrifice. Let religious leaders donate one month's salary toward fund for Negro housing and education. I propose that you, Mr. President, declare state of moral emergency. A Marshall Plan for aid to Negroes is becoming a necessity. The hour calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. But the march that we all remember and commemorate went on beyond the imagination, beyond the imagination of the organizers. The march on Washington took place in this context, led by the great black labor leaders A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin, two extraordinary giants. It was an example of magnificent organization and planning. King and Heschel became the two great religious figures leading the movement that grew stronger and stronger after the march. We young people were constantly inspired by these two giants of the spirit. 
quote, 100 years ago the emancipation was proclaimed. It is time for the white man to strive for self-emancipation, to set himself free of bigotry. Those were Heschel's words. Dr. King told us, quote, the time is always ripe to do right. As young Jews, my friends and I understood that it was our turn to stand up and be counted. We were being called to the ultimate test. Dr. King taught us, quote, courage faces fear and thereby masters it. Cowardice represses fear and is thereby mastered by it, unquote. We concluded that we had to put our lives on the line to help end discrimination and violence against African Americans, or we would become the good Germans of our time and simply look the other way. The advancement of civil rights in America did ultimately take place in the legislatures and courts of the United States, but it began in the streets of Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham with common people, everyday citizens, standing up for what was right and civil. We young Jews were as moved spiritually by hearing King preach in a Baptist church as by hearing Heschel in a synagogue. Truth be told, we did not hear Rabbi Heschel giving sermons. We heard him speaking with his Eastern European accent at public rallies for civil rights. We witnessed him marching with Dr. King at the front of the line of the famous march from Selma to Montgomery, and when Heschel returned to New York, he told us, quote, I felt as if my legs were praying, unquote. When we heard those words, we knew where we belong. Rabbi Heschel's inspiring words lifted us up, gave form to our innocent, youthful spirit. He removed the fear from our hearts. In this universal arena of civil rights, Heschel mixed the religious and so-called secular worlds in his thoughts and spoken word. Quote from Heschel, There is an evil which most of us condone and are even guilty of, indifference to evil. We remain neutral, impartial, and not easily moved by the wrongs done unto other people. Indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. It is more universal, more contagious, more dangerous, a silent justification. It makes possible an evil erupting as an exception, becoming the rule, and being in turn accepted. That equality is a good thing, a fine goal, may be generally accepted. What is lacking is a sense of the monstrosity of inequality." Unquote. He found original ways to express the link between Judaism and the civil rights struggle. Quote, God is every man's pedigree. He is either the father of all men or no man. The image of God is either in every man or in no man, unquote. The struggle for civil rights remains a poignant and demanding one all over the world. The lesson of the American civil rights movement is that we shall overcome. Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel set in motion a process that became international in scope and will not end because a new tyrant or tyranny arises to threaten us. It is, however, a challenge to live in a time without a Heschel and a King to guide us, to inspire us, to focus us. In those years, we could still be inspired by rabbis, ministers, and priests who were pious advocates of religion on the one hand and the leading social activists of those times on the other. Today, many of the religious leaders throughout the world are filled with self-righteous indignation, which easily turns into disdain for the other, and then ultimately to violence. Three weeks before King's assassination, Heschel was being belatedly fated by the members of the conservative movement's rabbinical assembly at their annual convention for his 60th birthday. He had asked that Dr. King be invited to give the major talk in his honor. Heschel introduced Dr. King to the hundreds of gathered rabbis with the following extraordinary words, and I quote, Martin Luther King is a voice, a vision, and a way. Martin Luther King is a sign that God has not forsaken the United States of America. 
I call upon every Jew to follow in his path, to heed his word. The whole future of America will depend upon Martin Luther King, unquote. Strong words, strong heart, stronger soul. In 1965, after the beatings of Bloody Sunday in early March, Dr. King secured a federal court order providing protection for what became the famous March from Selma to Montgomery. The court order was issued on a Friday morning, and Dr. King then called Rabbi Heschel asking him to come to Selma and be at his side on Sunday morning. After Shabbat, Heschel went to the airport and flew to Montgomery, and this famous picture was taken of the front of the line of march that Sunday morning. At that famous confrontation, which marked a dramatic turning point in the history of the civil rights movement, Heschel said, quote, for many of us, the march from Selma to Montgomery was about protest and prayer. Legs are not lips, and walking is not kneeling, and yet our legs uttered songs. Even without words, our march was worship, unquote. A political social protest was being equated with the most sublime and refined form of spirituality. These simple words of Heschel's are simply extraordinary. From there, Heschel went on to lead the religious movement against the war in Vietnam, together with the Reverend William Sloan Coffin of the Riverside Church in New York City and Dr. King. It was Heschel who urged and probably convinced King into speaking out against the war. King's historic talk on April 4th, 1967, exactly one year before he was the victim of an assassin's bullet in Memphis, Tennessee, is one of his ex most extraordinary collections of words. There was almost a mystical power in the similarity of thought between Heschel and King. Heschel's definition, quote, a Jew is a person whose integrity decays when unmoved by the knowledge of wrong done to other people, unquote. King taught, quote, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it, unquote. Heschel's direction, quote, to be or not to be is not the question. How to be and not to be is the question. The true problem is how to survive, what sort of future to strive for. It is the power and the vision of time to come that determines time present, unquote. King's direction, quote, history will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Unquote. Heschel's demand, quote, equality is a good thing. What is lacking is a sense of the monstrosity of inequality, unquote. King's demand, quote, a right delayed is a right denied, unquote. And finally, in conclusion, in their words, King, the ultimate measure of a person is not where he or she stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk his or her position, prestige, and even life for the welfare of others." Unquote. And Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, charging us today 51 years after his untimely death, quote, a religious man or woman is a person who holds God and human in one thought at one time at all times who suffers in him or herself harms done to others, whose greatest passion is compassion, whose greatest strength is love and defiance of despair. Thank you very much. Now I have a few, before you give me questions, I just have a few more informal stories, um, which are a little different in tone. So 
Um, my friend, Rabbi Moshe Shur, Mickey Shur, in that picture with Dr. King, with me, um, yet we once did look like that. You can imagine what happens at the Heschel School when we put that picture up and we say, you know, that's me. <laughs> they laugh. <laughs> you know, even the elementary school laugh. Um, so because we were staff members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference when Dr. King was assassinated, we went immediately to Atlanta to lend our assistance at Dr. King's funeral because uh, in 1968, there was no bottled water, there were no cell phones, thousands of people from all over the world were coming to Atlanta for the funeral, and the SCLC needed as many staff people as possible to walk with those people through the streets of Atlanta. If you've ever seen pictures of the funeral, there was a, a, a large contingent of people they were, they came from all over the world who marched across Atlanta from the Ebenezer Baptist Church where the funeral service took place to originally the Morehouse College campus where Dr. King was first buried. Now he is buried near the church in the King Center, but then it was across town. And along that march, all of us were assigned to walk with different people. So when we got to Atlanta, we were given three tasks, which turned out to be quite historic. Uh, sometimes people actually think that I make it up, but I didn't. Anyway, or maybe I did, who knows? The, I'll show you in a moment. So the first task was when we got to Atlanta, we were told to go back to the airport and pick up Rabbi Heschel, who was coming to see Coretta Scott King. Mrs. King had asked Rabbi Heschel to participate in the funeral service, and she wanted to meet with him in her home uh, the night before the funeral. So we went to the airport. We brought Rabbi Heschel to the King residence, and that was our first task. Then we basically, all of the volunteers spent the night in and around the Ebenezer Baptist Church. There were just all kinds of tasks to do. But, um, but the story of the funeral itself has antecedents in something many years earlier. When President John Kennedy was assassinated, the story goes that Dr. King was watching the funeral on television with his wife, Coretta. And when uh, the plane was coming back from Dallas with Kennedy's body, Jackie Kennedy had the presence of mind to ask her assistants to call the Smithsonian Museum and ask them to take out of the museum the cortege, the military horse-driven wagon, beautiful black lacquered painted wagon that carried Abraham Lincoln's body from Washington to Springfield, Illinois, where he was buried, for use with her husband, with, with, with President Kennedy. So Dr. King and Coretta were watching on television as this beautiful wagon was being led across from the National Cathedral to Arlington where John Kennedy is buried. And it was pulled by six beautiful white horses and attached to the middle horse was a black horse unbridled with its stirrups having boots in them facing backwards as a symbol of a fallen soldier. And the horse unbridled was constantly sort of pulling away from the train of the six horses, again as a symbol of the rupture that had taken place in the American culture and society. So Dr. King, looking at this picture, he was 34 years old. He said, Corey, I am not going to live out the days of my life, and when I die, I want to be buried the way the poorest black sharecropper is buried. No hearse, no fancy wagon like this, not even horses, just a simple farm wagon made out of wood, used, and two mules. About four o'clock in the morning of the morning of the funeral, we were all sort of standing around outside the church, and it was clear that only one mule had appeared. Some of you may even have in your elementary school classrooms one of the two or three books that have been written, Bell the Mule. There are a few of these 
children's storybooks about the mules. What I'm going to tell you is not in the books. So our supervisor, Hosea Williams, turned to us. He said, Mickey, Peter, go with this black farmer out to his church. He's got a mule that we can bring back in because we've got to have the second mule here by the time the mule train has to leave. So we jumped onto this farm wagon. We drove about an hour outside of Atlanta. Obviously, neither Mickey nor I know anything about mules, but you know from sort of comedy that the problem with a mule is getting it to move wherever you want it to move. So, you know, we were doing whatever we had seen in the movies, and it took a while, but we got that mule onto this flat, flat bed truck and then came back to Atlanta and uh, in time for that mule to be the second mule for the, uh, for the funeral train. And the third task that we were given, everyone was assigned to walk with one of the dignitaries who, were, who had come to Atlanta for the funeral. Mickey and I were assigned to walk with Rabbi Heschel and with Senator Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy, then a candidate for the presidency, presidential nomination of the Democratic Party, would himself be felled by an assassin's bullet two months later. It's really. Sometimes I think that I made this up. Um, and in fact, uh, years ago, I was in Israel during the summer, and I had an American television, one of these history channel shows on. And in the program, they, uh, it was about 1968 and the different assassinations. And all of a sudden, I saw the march of people walking across the screen. And I said to my then eight or nine-year-old daughter, Nessa, um, Nessa, I'm in, I'm in the picture. She said, Abba, stop. I said, no, seriously, come look. I'm somewhere in this picture. She said, Abba, that's ridiculous. And then all of a sudden, as she wasn't looking, I saw myself walk across the screen, but it was like two seconds. I came back. I tracked down what this was. I bought, you do remember what, a videotape. <laughs> I bought a videotape, which, by the way, you could run on slow motion, see, which you can't do with a DVD, run on slow motion. And there, my memory was correct. There we were with Rabbi Heschel and, uh, and with uh, Bobby Kennedy. And on that walk, I was 22 years old. John Kennedy had been assassinated in 1963. He was the embodiment of all of our hopes and dreams for this country. Now, five years later, Martin Luther King is dead also by an assassin's bullet. As young people, we felt like this, <laughs> the, 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 the world is collapsing. And at a certain point as we were walking, I sort of threw my hands up in the air and I said, Rabbi Heschel, what are we to do? And as was often the case, he didn't answer me right away. He kept walking. And then at a certain point, he turned around and he said, you must teach the children. You must teach them a Judaism that can remake the world. And then he kept walking. Now what he was doing, which he often did, everybody is familiar with the first paragraph of the Shema, which we translate, Vishinantem Levanecha, as you shall teach them diligently unto your children. But in reality, that translation belongs in the second paragraph of the Shema, where it says, Vilimaditemotam, in the PL, where it's an intensive form of the verb. And that's what he was quoting. Now, I was 22 years old. I completely, immediately forgot what he said. 20 years after Heschel's death in 1972, in 1992, we were planning an event for that 20th yard site at the Heschel School. We were sitting around a table in our director's office, and I had a flashback to this scene. I won't, it would be presumptuous to say that I've done what Heschel told me to do, but I'm willing to say that I have tried to do what Heschel told me to do. So um, with that, let's take uh, some questions, and maybe take a few at a time, and. Um, uh, and, and I'm happy to try and answer them. Oh. <laughs> so modest. Tell me who you are. Hi. Um, hi, Michelle Sarna. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering how you feel about the evolution of the black and Jewish communities' relationship, especially in this moment, and what your hope is for the future. Uh, 
Hi, I'm wondering what your recommend, Gabby? I'm wondering what your recommendation is for people who want to be more involved in uh, racial equality movements today. Hi, this is piggybacking on Michelle's question. I'm Penny. Um, what do you say to those of us who are feeling resentful of having like participated and you know marched along with other uh, minorities and who are now feeling um, betrayed by those same minorities? So, as Beth will tell you and Rabbi Krauss will tell you, um, my question when I was invited was, can we have this conversation at this moment? In other words, what's a... Uh, and um, so there are a lot of things to say. So here's Heschel. He lost almost his entire family in the Holocaust. It would have been perfectly understandable for him to have come here and focused on Jews and the future of the Jewish people. My first answer is included in my remarks at the very beginning. Either we really believe what the Torah says, because, you know, we have all kinds of interpretations in Midrashim about why does the Torah start with creation and not with, uh, with Shemot. In a certain sense, it would make much more sense if this is a book about the Jewish people. Start with our story. Again, whether you believe in particular, if you believe that God wrote the Torah, even more so than if you believe that human beings wrote the Torah. The choice of saying that creation is the beginning of the whole story in a form, not 300 people or 3,000 people or even 30 people, just two, one man, one woman. Therefore, my starting point has to be, no matter what, everybody is my brother and sister. But that's not all that Breshit does. It also shows us, thank you, from the outset, that the strife between people is right there at the beginning. Brothers against brothers. And you know, a few weeks ago, we read this really extraordinary piece in the Torah where, where Joseph, where Yosef greets his brothers, and he sees they're really nervous when they find out who he is. And he says to them, uh, throwing me in that pit wasn't you. This was God. This was... Uh, you know, takes the burden off of their shoulders. For me, those pieces are my work. I may not, I'm, I'm, uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not a preacher. I'm just speaking for myself. I may not allow myself to turn against the greatest evil in the world because all of those evils are being committed by human beings. So I have to work very hard when people disappoint me. And they not only disappointed me on this side of the ocean, they disappointed me over there as well. The fact that human beings can do the kinds of things to each other, it, it's a, obviously a violation of everything that I believe in. But my job, as I understand my job as a Jew, is not revenge, is not hatred, is not creating a set of scales. If you do for me, I do for you. I'm entitled to feel terribly disappointed at moments. By the way, I don't know about your house, but I sometimes feel disappointed in various age groups in my family at various times, and believe me, they feel the same about me. Now you can say, don't joke about this, because what we're talking about is much bigger but the bigger is only bigger because of the small. So I feel that I've got work to do 
to have people understand that they're, that, that it's not that they disappointed me, it's that they have hurt me and themselves as human beings. But what I just read to you is a legacy that I do not think most American Jews carry with them in an ongoing consciousness. That we live in a country where for hundreds of years we participated in the complete and total dehumanization of people. The other day I was reading from 1619, the historical book about the whole slave trade. And I thought to myself, what must it have been for these men, women, children to be removed from their families and their homes to never return, to never return, all gone, let alone the complete dehumanization that they experienced from that moment on, and what is still part of our culture, not only in this country, but all over the world. So I've got work to do, and I, don't, I just don't have time. I, I, need to, I need to repair, I need to work at repairing the ruptures that, that exist in the world. I don't have time for feeling angry at people who at the moment don't see it the way I see it. It's a very bad feeling at the moment. I completely understand what you're asking, both questions. But that's not a way for me to be able to live. I'm going to ultimately eat out my own heart. And if anything, I would say that in these days where we now see what the power of modern weapons are on the one hand and the power of brutal hatred is on the other without all of those weapons, we better fear for ourselves. And therefore, our task can't be to be angry or feel badly about other people's treatment of us. We've got to get rid of all this stuff. Our job is to be prophetic. It's not to accept. Now, I, I, I'm not trying to diminish what you're asking about. But I honestly feel like that route takes us nowhere. And, and as a teacher, I got to go someplace else. L let me just add one other thing. It was mentioned in my bio. By the way, I'm violating some rules here, you know, because I'm, I'm not allowed to come to SAR and talk about Kivunim. You may not know that, but I've <laughs> never, never been invited, never been allowed to, even though we get a lot of Kivunim kids from SAR, but okay. So, but for the last 20 years, I have been traveling all over the world. And I have, by virtue of what Rachel taught me and what I learned from Dr. King, I, I find myself with really deep friendships with people from all over the world. It's really, you know, quite extraordinary. When my students sit before His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama in private audience, and he says to them, you know, we admire the Jewish people because you have been able to sustain your culture and tradition for thousands of years in exile and we're struggling after 50 or 60. That's a profound Jewish educational experience from a person who's very far from being Jewish. And I'm now experiencing that all over. And I, it took me a while to realize what I'm experiencing is what actually I've always been taught. The Torah is not a private book for me, Peter Geffen, or for the Jewish people. This is a, um, a lesson plan for humanity. So my job is to get it out there and not to hold in and not to hold in things that are going to eat me up. So I have to talk to people. I have to talk to people and I have to listen to some painful things and I have to then be able to say, you know, this hurts me, and maybe you have not sort of thought about it in the way in which I think about it. I, I presume that many of us can imagine what 
the non-Jewish world does see. They may not understand our side, but what they see is really quite brutal. So for the moment, they're not on our team. But that's just momentary. What was that question that I didn't answer? Um, I think what I, I, I would say the following. I think the, the most important thing of involvement is first um, knowledge and awareness of what's going on. That means not only reading the newspaper, it also means really pursuing knowledge of what all these issues that face us are all about, not jumping to conclusions, really trying desperately to put oneself in the other person's shoes. That's what empathy really is. That's the best answer I can give you.